So it's nice to begin these retreats with a deep welcome. And to really do that deep welcome, we have to sense and feel into the here and now and the land we stand on. And uh, I think in so many ways, it's really appropriate whenever we meet each other, create a sacred space to sit together, to be together, to just acknowledge the so many cycles of suffering that we're part of, that we're reverberating with, one of the obvious examples is that all of us, I'm assuming most of you are in the States, United States, but you know, we're living on stolen land, broken treaty land of the indigenous nations. And of course, this isn't the only example of how our lives are built on suffering. You know, much of the wealth of this country came from the slave trade and slavery for many hundreds of years and oh, so many other kinds of exploitations going on even today. And it isn't meant to be depressing, it's meant to ground us in the reality in which we live so that we do our retreat together, not with some superficial or idealistic sense, but just this truth of what it is to be a human being. And it's just one generation after another and the way that power takes advantage of its power and harms other people. And so when we said, you know, one of the things we notice is the reverberation. Whoever, however, we're located in culture being part of one or more marginalized, the press groups, or being one of the more privileged people, where our hearts are reverberating with the injustice, with the suffering, and also, hopefully, probably, with a lot of wisdom, a lot of joy, a lot of belonging. And it's this rich mix that makes us human beings. And Shelly and I, of course, and the other people involved in the retreat, Matthew, the caretaker out at the retreat center, and Robin, who will be managing the kitchen, and Gabe, who helps so much to organize this retreat. We really want these retreat opportunities to be available for everybody who, who's interested in the practice, regardless of your lived experience and your cultural location. And we know we're not there yet. And as essential as a sense of safety is for doing the practice, it's like it's not so easy for us humans to open to things as they are when we feel threatened or afraid. So we aspire to create a safe environment and we know it's not perfectly safe, probably for any of us, and for some, less safe than for others. And that's the reality that we share even within this retreat container that we're creating together. But hopefully this will inspire us to do whatever we can, even those of us on Zoom, to do whatever we can to create safety for each other. And part of that is just even how we relate to the schedule, how we show up in Zoom and how we show up in the Dharma Hall and, and all the other spaces at the retreat center. And just uh, taking advantage of the sensitivity that we can have for each other. Because I'm guessing we, each of us, we know the experience of suffering. And just as we know that experience of suffering, we know that everybody else has their own version of suffering and it really can inspire us not to want to contribute to that. And Shelley will talk more later about the refuges and precepts, and just the uh, ways to help us take care of each other. 
Because doing retreats, you know, of course, there are times when we'll feel bored, but it's a pretty radical thing for us to train the heart to be open and to be embodied and to be, in a sense, exposed to everything that's in motion. The whole world, the past actually lives on in motion in our bodies right now, subtly and not so subtly. So I really think of it as a, a radical thing that we do. And uh, we can draw on three supports for this work that we're gonna be doing together. We have this, you know, and it will be different in different moments, but we have this capacity to simplify our environment. And this really helps us feel safe enough to open. And this is an ongoing dance of how we retreat. I mean, Shelly and I have some general recommendations, like that we shut our phones off or seriously limit how we use our phones and other media devices, the radio, TVs, et cetera, even mail and magazines and other reading material that really isn't directly related to our practice. And even the reading material that might be related to our Dharma practice, even limiting that. So it's just like micro doses, if that's good medicine, but not to use it as a way of avoiding feeling, being open with our experience in the moment. So what can help with to sort of make that a little bit easier is we retreat from our duties and responsibilities for as much as we can. Those of us living at home on Zoom for this retreat will have fewer you know, parameters that we can back away from. We still may have our roommates or a family living with us. We still may have responsibilities for our pets. <clears throat> and perhaps other things while we're on retreat. But just to understand that in order to have the stability and the safety, one of the things you get to play with is, can I simplify my experience and will that help? So maybe I'll like even, for example, in the midst of one set, just deciding, you know what? I feel like moving my body, but I think I'll just hold my body still. Because it's a kind of medicine, like I'm secluding myself from being the one who's gonna move my body because I have an impulse to move my body. Just like I'm retreating from being the one who's gonna check my email just because there's an impulse to check my email or my texts. So we can retreat from these ordinary duties, like the duty to move my body when my body hurts, or the duty to check my email or my text when I have that impulse, or to eat whenever I want to eat, because those of you especially who are on at the retreat center, you know, you were submitting, you're submitting to the schedule there and the, the meals that are served there. But we can really, instead of seeing that seclusion and that simplicity, as like a burden, I think it's really useful to turn it around and see it as a kind of spiritual medicine that we can use, try to learn how to use effectively to keep things really simple. And to notice that when things are simple, the heart feels safer. There's just fewer stimuli, fewer things triggering <clears throat> all of our unprocessed pain <laughs> and confusion <clears throat> excuse me, and other, you know, impulses and tendencies that are there in our heart. You can see as you look through the schedule, you know, that it's really set up to be simple. We're sitting and we're walking and we're sitting and we might do some standing practice or some lying down practice during the day and Every once in a while, it'll be time for meal practice and hearing the teachings practice 
which is really like a meditation. It's just that Shelley or I will be talking, you know, a few times during the day, offering instructions. But it's really a meditation practice, and you can treat it as such. It's really a nice practice, actually, to use the instructional times as if you're in a meditation. And, you know, when we're in a meditation, it doesn't mean we can't move. It just means when we move the body, when we adjust the posture, we're doing it intentionally because it's the appropriate thing to do in that moment. And if it doesn't feel, if it feels neurotic, like we're moving because we're bored or whatever, we're aversive, well, then maybe we can just feel what that feels like for at least a while. That's a huge support, but we need to be conscious about how seclusion in all its various ways is available to us, how we can simplify, how we can retreat from complication. So just keep that in mind as just one way to use your retreat, one sort of area of practice to create stability, to create safety. What can I let go of? How might I retreat from complexity and diversity of experience to simplify my experience as a human being, to make it more likely that my heart is willing to be wide open and interested and relaxed and alert and seeing things clearly, feeling things deeply in this embodied way. What might support that? A whole other arena that supports the practice is the community. And it's quite different for those of you at the retreat center than it will be for us on Zoom. But we really want you know, to get good at using the community energy. So we have to experiment. Like those of us on Zoom, you know, how can we take advantage of the community energy? I was talking uh, to somebody earlier today um, and they were just mentioning how, uh, you know, just getting into the retreat space early or staying late. I was doing a practice interview with a student earlier in the day and they had done a retreat at Spirit Rock and they're about to do a longer retreat in a couple of weeks. And, and just the, feeling the combination of being alone, but feeling the community energy in the room, right? And uh, those of us on Zoom, we have to really sense the Zoom space as that retreat space that holds the community energy. And we wanna treat it as a sacred space. Now, if you're like me, you know, a lot of us were sitting on a couch or we're sitting at our desk and there may be other things here, but whatever you can do to realize this is in fact the sacred space of the community gathering together around these teachings and around these practices. And, it, and this particular community space also represents the great lineage of people before us with their complicated, challenging lives having done the practice, having realized, woken up, become wiser, kinder human beings, passing the teachings along generation after generation. And so we're actually the, the very real continuation of this community energy. The question is, how are we going to feel that? How are we going to remember that? How are we going to keep that in mind? because there's a lot of juice and a lot of that uh, energy of belonging and that, yeah, just that support, especially through the dry and challenging times that inevitably show up for us practitioners. We really feel like, I don't know if it's worth it. Well, maybe it's worth it for other people, but I don't know if it's worth it for me or, you know, or whatever kind of, whatever the expression of doubt might be. We'll have small groups, two out of the three full days. Make sure to look through that document 
um, carefully. Those of you at the retreat center, Shelley, and we'll let you know when your small groups are, but the people on Zoom, make sure that you know when you're meeting. And even if you don't feel like coming to the small group, you know, it's obviously we can't make people go, but please consider showing up as a gift to the community, as your way of saying, I'm here for you. I'm willing to be part of the group. I'm willing to let the small group be a teacher of mine. Same thing with the other instructional periods through the day. We'll sit together early in the morning, do some chanting and sit in silence. Then we'll have that gathering for the morning instructions, um, which will be sit at 9.15 to 10.15 every morning. Then the small groups will happen between that ending of the morning instructions and lunch. We'll come back at 2.15 for our afternoon instructions that Shelly or I will lead. Then guided Qigong mindful movement practice in the afternoon at 4.30. Evening Dharma reflection, seven to eight. And then an evening sit together, 8.30 to nine with some chanting. So now I know there will be a few of you who won't be able to make all of those sessions, but please aspire to be at all of those sessions. And when your heart feels like I don't wanna be there, really remember the community that we're here for each other that we're showing up for each other. There still may be some legitimate reasons why you're not gonna show up, but make sure it isn't, uh, yeah, just be thoughtful about the commitment you've made to be on this retreat. And with that, and, and that we're kind of counting on each other to hold this container. And it's very easy to dismiss, especially for those of us on Zoom, because it can feel more like I'm just here in my home. You know, I, I'm on my own and I got to find my own way. Well, in a way we're on our own, but we're on our own together in community. And we want to keep that in mind. So another little trick for those, especially those on Zoom is just to look around. People who have their videos on and just remember that's a human being. They're true doing the same thing I'm doing. They're having the same kind of struggles I'm having. I'm not alone. And I bet my presence makes it a little bit easier for them to stick with the practice. We wouldn't really be able to do this alone. It, it would be very challenging for any of us. So that's the second piece. First is just, we all have this ability to simplify our experience. Like instead of thinking about that, I can choose not to think about that. And my experience right now is a little bit more simple many other ways. We can really use the community energy, find skillful ways to tap in to the love and the support of not just this present time community that we're doing the retreat with, about 10 people at the retreat center, about 34 people now online, but all those before us. And then the third support for our practice is these teachings from the Buddha. And, uh, you know, I'm 40 years in being a de devoted student of the Buddha, and I just continue to find so much relevance, so much value. It, it literally blows my mind still. I feel so enlivened and excited at times um, by these teachings and how directly functional, useful, pragmatic they are in my life. You know, one of the basic teachings that the Buddha gave is to abandon what is unhelpful, unwholesome, to cultivate what is useful and wholesome, and to purify the heart, meaning just to cultivate and stabilize the openness and sensitivity of the heart so that we're better at abandoning what's not helpful and cultivating what is helpful. I mean, it's so straightforward, it's so pragmatic. And the teachings are just a roadmap about what can be abandoned, what can be cultivated, 
and how to stabilize and strengthen the sensitivity, the openness, the clarity, so that we can find our way. And I wanted to share a particular teaching before passing it on to Shelley. And uh, for those of you on Zoom, it's in our Google Doc that you have with our Zoom link and the small groups listed. One of the handouts is this uh, document called the Stability and Unification of Present Moment Awareness. The Stability and Unification of Present Moment Awareness. And for those of you at, at the retreat center, Matthew will print some copies for you tomorrow. It's just a one page little cheat sheet on this particular teaching from the Buddha that I think might be helpful. And, you know, always for these retreats, we like to, we'll be giving different instructions. You know, there's so many different maps and pointing out instructions for us. And they're all covering the same territory, like, the nature of our own heart right here, this heart and our subjective experience and how to be closer, more intimate, more clear, less distorted as we open to things as they are, the nature of the mind, the nature of experience, and therefore finding, discovering the causes for stress and the causes for release. And that's how we find our way. And this particular set of instructions on the five jhanic factors, that's sort of the technical um, description, but it's really, like I said in the title, it's really about how the heart, the mind becomes stable and unified, gathered. And when we use that word samadhi, you know, one way to think about samadhi, you could just define it as, it, you know, it gets translated as many of you know, as concentration, a better translation might be the unification of the heart. But another definition that I really like is in those moments when the heart's unified, when we're really intimate, really present, and, and there's a, a substantial sense of solidity, like presence is really, it's got some power, it's got some, uh, stability. It's not going to be knocked over or pushed around by experience. So whatever experience shows up, the clarity and the kindness has some real stability, some real solidity. And one of the definitions I like is every aspect of the heart and mind is working around the same value of being intimate with the present moment, really connecting, really being present. As opposed to our more ordinary mind, it's sort of like one aspect of the mind is doing this and another aspect is doing something else. It's sort of they're working you know, with opposing values or opposing aims. So when the, every aspect of our heart and mind is uh, unified, has this integrity of valuing just one thing, being present. And being present allows for many, you know, many expressions of our life. It doesn't limit us to be present. It allows for so much creativity, so much nimbleness, and so much skill as we find our way, navigate our way with all the, you know, relatedness, all the relating to this and relating to that. And, being quiet and speaking up and all the things we do as a human being. And that value of that, that sort of radical, radically strong and clear and nimble and soft, it's a soft power, not a rigid, brittle power. That is really what our retreat is about. And so these five aspects of that stabilization, that unification might be helpful for you. You could probably, even if you've never heard this list, you could probably guess what the first of these five factors that support the stabilizing and unifying of awareness. And it's, you know, because it's clearly the first step, right? The heart has to make this effort to connect. And, it, it, and it's, 
in a way, it's the grossest um, aspect of what allows the heart to unify in this stability of awareness. There needs to, when it's, when the heart isn't currently connected to the present moment, like lost in thought, distracted, then the heart has to make the effort to connect. It has to care enough about being connected to move through the habit to be distracted, whatever the distraction is in the moment, to reconnect. So it's in a way, it's a, it's a very real personal effort to connect. The Pali word is vitaka. And it's interesting, like uh, each of these five factors that I'm going to mention tonight, and I'm just going to go through them briefly, and I'll pick it up uh, a little later in the morning instructions. But <clears throat> just to connect it, it removes dullness from the mind. Because interestingly, maybe even paradoxically, making effort is energizing. <laughs> And this is one of the many paradoxes in spiritual life. We think wrongly that I need energy to make effort, but it's really the other way around. When we make effort, wholesome effort, we start to feel energized. Making effort is energizing. Acknowledging, oh, it's like this now is energizing. Remaining unaware not making the effort to recognize the present moment will lead to dullness, sleepiness, heaviness, heavy states. So you can check that out. Like as you get curious about this first factor and really resolve to learn a thing or two about it and how to really develop it as a mental strength, you know, a mental factor that you can count on, like the capacity to connect to the present moment, you'll see how it's energizing. So check it out. See if the Buddha was right. Is making the effort to connect. Now remember, it's as simple as connecting to the present moment. And the effort is not to be seduced by distractedness. You know, like being lost in our thought about this or that including our Dharma thoughts. Like, what does the Buddha mean by the present moment? The next one is sustaining, the sustaining. So uh, sometimes it gets, we talk, the first one gets translated as the initial application of the heart. Like applying the heart to the present moment. And then the second one, we chara is the Pali is the sustain, the sustaining application of the heart, right? That sort of committing the heart to the present moment. I don't know much, but I'm really committed to the present moment. I'm really suspicious of distraction. And remember, this isn't the same as hating thought or thinking or thinking that thinking is the problem, right? It's being lost in thought means there's thinking, but there's no awareness that thinking is happening. Oh, it's just thoughts. I'm thinking this through and this is being known. So there can be awareness of thought, present moment awareness. Oh yeah. It's like having space around the mind that is thinking through something. But let's be honest, that's not our habit. <laughs> our habit when we're thinking is to dive in and to be unaware that thinking is happening when we're thinking. We lose that space of present moment awareness. So sustaining present moment awareness is not some simple thing. It's relatively simple to learn about that factor of connecting. And it's a whole another level of discovery to learn about sustaining present moment awareness. It's like learning how to be, you know, I've never ridden a wild Bronco, but just, you know, any 
uh, you know, whether it's surfing or skiing or any time, and maybe some of you have, you know, what are what they call paragliding, <laughs> no, but wherever you're with natural elements, kayaking, and something that's really wild in the sense of not under our, not being able to be dominated by our human willfulness. And you have to learn like to stay there, to stay in it, you have to really submit to the wildness. This gets us a little bit of a sense of what it means to sustain present moment awareness. Even with something relatively simple, like using one of your meditation anchors, like breathing. And then the third one is joy. And I'll just leave it here tonight. I'll just say a few words about joy. These first three are enough. So we have the factor of connecting with the present moment, getting really interesting. Remember, being really interested means we'll fail almost an infinite number of times where we'll sustain present moment awareness until we don't. <laughs> and then we'll discover being lost in thought and we'll forgive ourselves and hopefully have a really serene sense of humor about one more time being lost in thought, being caught up in some this or that. And then we'll connect. And we'll sustain. And every time it's like, you know, the, the little kid getting back on the surfboard or, you know, whatever, getting back in the kayak or whatever it might be. And just trying to find that way to merge in a way with the reality of the present moment to kind of just keep it in mind. Because it isn't about dominating. We'll never sustain present moment awareness by dominating it. We only sustain present moment awareness by aligning. And this is why the third factor is PT is the Pali word. Some of you know that means usually gets translated as joy or rapture or even joyful interest or lightness, buoyancy of the heart. And it is the experience of the wisdom, the awareness, seeing, sustaining present moment awareness, which means it's experiencing the wildness of everything being in motion, because that's kind of the defining characteristic of the present moment is it's alive with movement. The movement of thought, the movement of emotion, the movement of feeling, sensation, sound, sight, touch, smell, hearing. But what really characterizes is this, it's so alive with movement. And when the heart is sustaining, that means it's not trying to dominate, it's not creating friction. And that absence of friction we call joy. Everything being alive and the heart not resisting the aliveness of the present moment. That's experience is that, that lightness of heart, that buoyancy, that upliftment, right? As if the heart itself begins to smile. And that matures into sukha or ease, which matures into stillness, one-pointedness, which is the fifth ekagata. And Shelley and I will be naturally mentioning these other aspects of that unifying and stabilizing of present moment awareness. But so much of our personal effort as a practitioner is this willingness to connect again with the reality of the present moment, the reality of embodiment, to be curious about sustaining that presence and really relying on the telltale arising of joy. It feels good to sustain present moment awareness, even if we're being aware of physical pain or loneliness. The loneliness is unpleasant, but the sustaining of a, that honest and clear and forgiving presence, that feels deeply good. Subtle generally, but it subtle does not mean it's not significant. So that's a little just to get us started tonight with our practice. So uh, why don't we take maybe, what do you think, Shelly, like three minutes to stretch our legs?